Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. So a lot of things have changed in the past year. New rules, lockdowns, social distancing. They have changed our lives to different extents in different ways. But one change you may not have thought about is your microbiome. Yes, you heard me right. The human microbiome that includes all the bacteria, fungi and viruses residing on or within your tissues. Notably, your skin, lungs and oral cavity. And what I'll focus mainly on in this video, your gut microbiome. Now, the microbiome is known to be dynamic. It changes as you age, depends on your sex, your geographical location and your diet. So you might be thinking, well sure, my microbiome has probably changed since a year ago. But this video is more than to point out the obvious. You see, the microbiome are not just passengers within our bodies, but they play a variety of functions. They aid in our digestion, they aid absorption of nutrients, they shape our immune response and synthesise their own bioactive compounds, such as short-chain fatty acids. So they're not just passengers, they play critical roles in metabolism, immunity and neural development, amongst other emerging functions. And so maybe unsurprisingly, the gut microbiome and dysbiosis of the gut microbiome has been associated with a variety of diseases, such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, autoimmune diseases and depression. And so if we think about the current pandemic, having a good immune response makes you less susceptible to severe consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Moreover, studies seem to be suggesting that obesity and type 2 diabetes may put you at a greater risk of developing more severe symptoms of COVID-19 infection. Now, with the help of this recent Perspective article and some other articles as well, for the remainder of this video, we will address three key points. Firstly, how the pandemic interventions might be altering our microbiome and decreasing its diversity. Leading on to secondly, why should you care about this? And is the pandemic just accelerating or helping us to further highlight the decline that's already being seen in microbial diversity throughout the past few decades? And how both the young and the old may be most vulnerable to these changes? And then thirdly, to stop me getting too negative, we'll end on a positive note talking about what can we and what can you do about this? And what should we do about this? Is it even a problem? So firstly then, how have the pandemic interventions potentially disrupted our microbiome? Well, disrupted may not quite be the correct word since the implications of the pandemic are going to vary from person to person. But overall, whether or not there's been enhancements or losses in microbiota can be summarised nicely in this perspective's figure. And so to break it down, we'll firstly look at ways in which you can gain microbiota and how the pandemic interventions may be disrupting this. So there are many different environmental factors that can foster microbial diversity. And so this includes mobility and the, the ability to travel, being out in the environment, being in close proximity to others, including the wider community and your own family and pets, as well as diets being very critical which we'll come back to a bit later. And as well, you'll notice that it also says mother and infancy is a critical moment when your microbiome is initially established. And we'll come back to that a, a little bit later as well. And so given that these are the ways in which you can enrich your microbiome, it becomes apparent that the preventions in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19 could be having impacts on your microbiome diversity. Firstly, hygiene is of critical importance to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And I'll probably reinforce this point at the end, but I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't be following these measures. These measures have been put in place for a purpose, and that is to prevent the spread of COVID-19. In fact, I'll come to the point at the end that the aim should be to both follow these measures and prevent COVID transmission, but also to be able to reduce any potential negative impacts that these prevention measures may be having, such as microbiome alterations. Anyway, back to my point, in this pandemic, we have made radical changes and hygienic measures. This has included the deployment of personal protective equipment, notably the wearing of face masks, the frequent hand washing and application of hand sanitizer as you enter different shops and workplaces, in addition to continuous cleaning of bleach in public places and with disinfectants in homes. And so, as I say, cleaning is essential to prevent the spread of this virus. But these measures may also be affecting general microbiome transmission. And to quote from this perspective article, implementing much stricter hygienic practices now to contain COVID-19 transmission is necessary, but increased hygiene may come at a microbial cost by decreasing microbial acquisition and re-inoculation following loss, although that cost is not yet known. And these aren't the only measures. The second way that transmission has also been 
prevented has been through all of the social interactions that have been disrupted. From the closing of schools to workplaces, from social distancing and the formation of social bubbles, these could all potentially be having negative consequences for microbial transmission. And so there are many reasons why you should care about your gut microbiome. Firstly, the fact that dysbiosis of the gut microbiome has been associated with a variety of diseases, as I mentioned earlier, including obesity and type 2 diabetes, which could put you at more risk of developing severe symptoms in response to COVID-19. But a more general reason why you should be interested or potentially concerned about this loss in microbial diversity comes down to the so-called hygiene hypothesis, first proposed in 1989 by David Strachan. Now, as by the name hypothesis, it is still yet to be fully proven, but it comes down to the fact that even despite the current pandemic, there has been a general decline in microbial diversity. And associated with this decline in microbial diversity has been an increase in immune hypersensitivities, such as asthma and other allergies. And so back in 1899, Strachan proposed the hygiene hypothesis after observing that hay fever was less common among children with older siblings, suggesting that those children had increased exposure to microbes in early childhood due to inevitable unhygienic contact with older siblings. And so although the evidence is a bit sparse at the moment, a recent demographic analysis of COVID-19 associated mortality rates in 122 countries have suggested that inadequate sanitation and exposure to microbial diversity may be associated with reduced COVID-19 associated mortality. And so in the study, they noted an inverse correlation between COVID-19 associated death rates and water quality scores. And so the authors of the study proposed that microbially stimulated, innately enhanced levels of type 1 interferon may be protective against COVID-19 mortality in these populations. And so to go back to an earlier point, the gut microbiome seems to be playing a major role in training the immune system. And so for these reasons, the impacts of hygiene and these pandemic interventions may be having a bigger toll on the microbiomes of the young and the old. So starting with the young, birth and early infancy are critical periods for microbiome establishment and development. And so the microbiome of newborns are initially colonised by maternal microbes acquired during vaginal delivery and through skin-to-skin contact, along with support for the microbiome from, from prebiotic foods and microbes provided in breast milk. And in line with the hygiene hypothesis, it's been shown that being born by cesarean section, for instance, appears to increase the risk of later allergy, asthma and obesity rates. And so it's likely that the microbiome could be at play in this association. And another key acquisition of microbiome for young children is through contact with others at school, which obviously as well is being implicated by the current prevention measures. And so whilst the microbiome has been shown to blossom through infancy and reach full maturity by adulthood, by later life, the microbiome diversity is known to decrease and many chronic diseases associated with ageing have some link to the microbiome. And so COVID-19 has dramatically affected the care, mobility and social interactions of elder populations. Moreover, elderly may have greater anxiety and fear for their own health during this pandemic whilst trying to cope with with the absence of social support and physical and emotional connection for their own and others' health. And so I've mentioned a number of possible problems that could be resulting from these pandemic interventions. But is it all bad news? Well, some evidence seems to be suggesting that some of the interventions may be beneficial to improving our microbiome diversity. For example, the closure of restaurants has resulted in an increase in home cooking, along with the conscientiousness of making better food choices in terms of trying to boost your immune system. For example, a small study was conducted in Spain, the so-called Spanish COVID diet study. And what they found was that COVID-19 confinement in Spain has led to the adoption of healthier dietary habits and behaviours in the studied population, as reflected by a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet. However, this is just a small study and the impact of the pandemic on our individual changes in food consumption timing, quantity, quality and frequency may profoundly be impacting our gut microbiome composition and function in a variety of different ways. For example, more generally, 
the pandemic has disrupted food supply chains and may be putting more vulnerable populations more at risk by facing food insecurity from the economic effects of the pandemic response. But there are things that we can do about this. Firstly, diet heavily influences the microbiome and that's something that can be easily changed. For example, increasing the consumption of probiotic foods, foods that contain living strains of bacteria. This includes fermented food products such as kefir, kombucha, miso, kimchi and even sourdough bread, which I do believe became a bit of a popular craze in the UK lockdown. And the most widely investigated fermented food is kefir, with evidence from at least one randomised control trial suggesting beneficial effects in both lactose malabsorption and helicobacter pylori eradication. Nonetheless, I feel like there still hasn't been enough investigation into the potential of these different probiotic foods in terms of improving the composition and function of the microbiome. Alternatives to probiotic foods are prebiotic foods, foods or chemicals that are important for the growth and proliferation of the microbiome, and most famous of this is increasing dietary fibre. And so in terms of the current pandemic, it's very important to ensure the provision of healthy food assistance to low-income families and children. Moreover, other interventions should be made to both prevent the spread of COVID-19, but also to aid healthy microbial diversity. This includes measures such as keeping open urban parks, but ensuring the maintenance of physical distancing, spending more time outdoors, avoiding unnecessary antibiotic use, and encouraging physical contact with those among co-quarantined family members and pets. And so these are kind of immediate actions that can be taken. But if we think more about the bigger issue at hand and the declining diversity in the microbiome, which, I mean, in all honesty, we still don't really know what the implications of this will be or if it is really a problem. But in the case that it is, we should start thinking about ways that we can act upon this. And so a lot of work is being done in terms of looking at microbiota transplants, which would be, I guess, an alternative to the taking of probiotics to try and increase the microbial diversity, for example, of the gut microbiome. Alternative interventional strategies include the development of drugs that can target, modify or mimic the gut microbiome activity. For example, one company that I know is researching this area is PureTech, which is asking the questions, what if we could treat immune and infectious diseases by mimicking the ways in which the gut microbiota maintains a healthy immune system in humans? So this is just a taste of the huge amount of research that is still being conducted and will continue to be conducted into the gut microbiome, which I find incredibly fascinating given that we are not alone in our bodies and we share our lives with our gut microbiome <laughs> well, and our oral microbiome and skin and lung microbiome. You know, we've got to embrace it, but we've got to look after it as well. And so, as I said at the start, this is a perspective of a perspective and there's still much we don't know about the microbiome and the implications of the pandemic. And so I lastly just want to reinforce my point that we should be aiming to both prevent COVID transmission and to reduce the negative impacts of pandemic control. And I think that there are ways that we can achieve this. So with that, I want to give a thank you to my Patreon supporters. And I hope you've learned something in this video. And thanks for listening.